Mark McDermott, welcome oh, to the Process Podcast. What, is it McDermott or McDermott? McDermott. It depends how where you're from. I don't know why I say it. You know why I say I think I. You know why I think I say McDermott? It's because Alex Younger always oh, loved Dermot McDermott. Kennedy. Yeah. Dermot Kennedy, mm, and he would say Northern. Dermot. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark, who are you, and what do you do? Uh, my name's Mark. Um, I'm now a coach here at Coastal. Um, I've been coaching for a very long time. I've been coaching 14 years. Um, I have interest in photography. I train. I love training. I love fitness. Um, and I love helping people get better at life. What What got you into coaching in the first place? Um, so my, as I was growing up, I've always been into sport. My mum worked in a gym. Her best friend was a personal trainer. And I got dragged into her spin classes for a very long time. Literally. Cool. Mark, you're coming to a, a spin class. So that was my first dose into the fitness world. Like how, how old are we talking? <laughs> Maybe... 10 11 that's pretty cool yeah and, and well, what was your mum doing was she like, she was what? just managing the company gotcha. um and yeah so she was one of the managers so we got to do pretty much whatever we wanted in that facility and her best friend kept dragging me into fitness and i was like i want to do that when i'm older like that is what i want to do uh, i also wanted to be a physio but then that was my two things and after that i was like no i want to be a personal trainer because education growing up wasn't one of my favorite things to do when you say education wasn't your favorite thing, do you mean like school? Yeah, I did not like school. Is it? Did you struggle with it? Was like the learning part hard? I were think you, the were learning you a bad boy getting. In trouble I think the, the learning time? part was hard, and I just yeah, I I took me longer than other kids to learn. Yeah. Um, but as I've grown older, I figured out how that works and how I can learn different ways. I mean, I wasn't planning on asking you about that at all, but now I'm just interested. So, <laughs> what what have you discovered in terms of what what? What are maybe the more conventional ways of learning that you find don't work with you? And how have you now, like, what is your learning style now? So I hate, I hate reading textbooks. I can't, if I read a page, I'll have to read it three times so I can remember anything, even one sentence. Um, but for me, watching videos or learning from someone personally. So like if it was to do with personal training and you're training someone, you're like, right, Mark, you're going to watch me and this is how you're going to learn and this is how I'm going to teach you what you're doing. And that I will, in my brain, I'll be like, ah, oh, I can pick that up. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. Like I'm a very visual and doing person. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I want to go back to, um, like young Mark, mm -hmm. who's like, you know, being exposed to spin classes and you say one day, that's what I want to do. Like at what age did you have that clarity? That's what you wanted to do. I would say by the age of 14. And, I was and pretty clear. did you know that you were going to be coaching people or was it like working in a gym? It was being a personal trainer. Really? Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Literally, I wanted to be a personal trainer. I started in a, a junior's gym at the age of 14 of funk bodybuilding style machine work. And I was a, literally addicted from 14. So is that when you started training? Yeah, yeah. 14 years old. It, but how, I wasn't allowed in gym since I was 16. Yeah. Every gym I tried to get into, they were like, you got two more years to wait. So I basically had to start at home oh, and no. have a home bench press <laughs> until I was 16 so I could go to a gym. Yeah. Whereas David Lloyd's had a separate gym for juniors and it was a lot lighter weight, but it was still machines, still treadmills, still rowers. That's awesome. Mm, sorry. You know, when I was, when we used to go on summer holidays and we would go to the, back to the UK, mm. whenever we would go past like, a local leisure and recreation recreation center you know the ones they're not they're not that nice but they have like a little swimming pool yeah uh they've got like, like a little your local gym. swimming pool yeah that yeah goes and to. they're just like exactly <laughs> every time i would go past one of those on holiday i'd say to my mom and dad i'm gonna own one of those one day and <laughs> i didn't know i didn't see the thing that's why i'm asking you about if you had the clarity on whether you want to be a coach we just wanted to work in a gym uh, i didn't know i wanted to be a coach i just knew that i was going to like own a facility mm. that had people doing fitness you just wanted fitness so yeah i just yeah. knew i just knew that's what i wanted oh, okay. and from like a really young age that's always what i dreamed of and then when i got to university and it was about picking the course for uni i, I basically applied to like leisure and recreation center management courses. Mm. I just knew that that was what so was that was your path. From yeah. Day one, and then I, did, I didn't, I didn't take that course, oh. in the end, which is stupid, <laughs> but I think it's interesting that you also had that same epiphany. Yeah, definitely. So, so talk me through your coaching journey. So you, you know, at a young age, you want to do it. You're yeah. training yourself at 14. Mm -hmm. What happens? Like how, when do you get into this and when do you actually start making this your career? So through school, obviously PE, sports education covered all that. Um, that was one thing I was good at learning because it was very, 
do it rather than read it. Yeah. Um, and then I went to college. I did my diploma in sport, exercise, and fitness. And within that diploma, I did a gym instructor qualification. Um, so this was when I was 17. And then at 17, my mum's best friend, she was the manager of the gym, a new gym, David Lloyd's. And she offered me, she managed to get me an interview for the gym when I was about, yeah, it was probably three months before I was 18 years old. Um, and I got the job and they let me start straight away. They were like, cool, you're 18 soon. You can start. We're not meant to accept you until you're 18, but we'll happily bring you on. You're just not allowed to take on any clients, but you'll learn the roles and responsibilities of the company. And that got me into being the personal trainer. And I was there for about five years. Um, and then... So, okay, pause there. Because I, I felt like I started coaching pretty young. I think I started yeah. coaching people about 20. Mm. And I felt young. Yeah. Because like um, a lot of the people I was coaching were in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Mm. And I felt... I guess I had a bit of imposter syndrome. I mm. felt that I was just inexperienced and I was a kid. I hadn't experienced anywhere near as much life for these people. Mm. And they were here paying me a lot of money for to basically to. change their life, <laughs> right? On basically the very limited experience I mm. had. Did you feel that as well? Yes. You should have seen pictures of me when I was in this gym. Braces. I looked like I'd just come out of school. And, I, and everyone I worked with, I think the next youngest person was 22. And then there's me. And then about a year after me working there, someone the same age joined. And that's when I was like, actually, it's a, I'm okay to be doing this now. But I was felt, felt very out. I did not feel comfortable. Everyone, I think the oldest person was 55. Yeah. And they were a personal trainer. And I was like, oh, they've been in this for 20 years. And I've just come out of college. And I'm still trying to learn this new job. But uh, uh, Did at any point you think that maybe this isn't for you? Uh, no, I think cause in my first year they trained me up very well cause it was more, it wasn't an apprenticeship, but it was like an apprenticeship and they were like, cool, you're going on this course. This, and I just did course after course after course. And it got me very confident with wanting to be there and believe it or not, a lot of people were interested in personal training with me. I'm not sure if that was cause I was friendly because I wasn't a teenager living on the streets like hanging out it was i wanted to be in the gym and i was doing something with my life and i was very good at talking to people then so i'd walk into a gym and I'd, that was my job i didn't have to train anyone but i had to talk to people mm. and i think that's what helps me say actually i can do this because people are now liking me and then i got into more classes my classes got full and i was like oh this is it and then i started getting then they put me on a trainer course personal trainer course and it just took off pretty quickly and I was about 19, 20 about then. So what happens next? After, after that job. Um, so that was five years um, in that same company. And then... Well, I'm sorry, which part of the UK are we talking here? Kent. Okay. Yeah, okay. South East. South yeah. East, London, Kent. That's in between the two. So. Yeah. So five years, David Lloyd. You're now 23? 20, 20, yeah, it was probably mid-22, somewhere there. Um that was when the brain aneurysm happened that we've spoke about in the past that not many people actually know about. I only tell certain people. Um, and that decided, long story short, I'm going to leave the country. I want to travel. I want to, I don't want to be stuck in the UK. Um, everyone seems a little bit stuck in their way and they don't go anywhere. They stay in their hometown. Um, so I had pestered someone. Um, he will tell you now if you speak to him. Diego, he's, I pestered him maybe for three, four months, probably every week. Have you got any jobs? Have you got any jobs? And this was for a place in Kuwait. And eventually he was like, okay, I've got your job. I've got you an interview. Just go and have your interview. And I think it was maybe a month later, packed and went just into one suitcase. Okay, we're going we're to have to, we have to pause on this for a okay. second. <laughs> so you skimmed over brain aneurysm. Yeah. Um, you shared a little bit with me, but I'd love to hear more. What what actually happened on that? It was a, like it was an event, wasn't it? Something happened. Something triggered it, and then it happened. It was maybe about three, four days after something else happened that made it worse. And so, what when you have a brain aneurysm? What 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 happens? So, from a brain aneurysm, a classic brain aneurysm looks like a mushroom, and that mushroom tends to can burst um i had scans 
for a long time, so no one can be scared anymore, is my brain, the way it's wired is slightly different in one junction of the brain. So my main cerebral artery, there's normally like a two way, it's like a one, normally like one bend. Mine's got three. So it goes down across and then it's like a triangle thing. Um, so they've realized that I've probably born with it. It's still a risk, but they've cleared me off of that risk now. And and how did you, how did you figure out you had a brain aneurysm? <laughs> so I was, the first time I got this headache was, it was doing death by back squats. So what, just every minute, you're just adding a new- Every another. minute, one back squat, 100 kilos. Minute two, two back squats, 200 kilos. Three, and I got to, I think I was on, from what I remember, it was maybe the 12 or the 13s. And I was midway through the set and I've just fallen back. Blacked out. I don't know if I blacked out or if I just laid on the floor. I don't actually remember the yeah. that part. So I'm assuming it was a blackout. And- were you by just, yourself? Were you with other no, people? No, was a whole the whole team were there. Like everyone who trained in that gym at the time was there. Um, I laid on the floor. I was like, oh, I've got a bit of a headache. And then it just got worse. And believe it or not, I carried on training. Of course. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's just a headache. Drink some water. Take some paracetamol. I'll be fine. Um, still headache, headache, headache. I think three days went past and it had died down a little bit. And I went to see a physio because I was like, oh, I think it's my neck. My neck is so tight from obviously doing a stupid workout. Yeah. Um, so he he massaged, he he noticed I had a super big knot here on my left shoulder. And he he just worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. And on my way home, I was walking and I just remember it felt like someone had smashed me over the head with a baseball bat. And it was the worst headache I've ever had in my life. But it was up the back of my head. So when I went to the hospital, they were like, oh, it, maybe it's a tumor, maybe it's this. But they, I waited there for seven hours. No one saw me. And I was just in pain. I was like, oh, this hurts. Paracetamol. They just kept giving me paracetamol. They were like, this will help with the pain. Um, and then one lady was walking around that trained at David Lloyd's and I was still work there at the time. And she was like, right, we're just gonna scan you just in case. Other doctors won't because you don't seem in too much pain, but I'm going to scan you just to be safe. Um, and then later that night, the results come back and <laughs> they literally was like, this is nothing to do with the back of your head, but you've got a brain aneurysm in the left side of your head, which didn't cause the blackout, didn't cause the pain, the headache. Um, we're going to have to keep you in, keep you on, do run loads of tests because this, we actually that we've Googled this result, um, which obviously put no confidence in me. I was like, oh, this hospital has no idea. Yeah. Um, but then they had reached out to King's College Hospital, which is head specialist in the UK. Um, so I was actually in hospital for about, I think, week, test after test, 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 constantly. Um, then results come back. There was no blood in my spine, like in my spinal cord, nothing. So it hasn't burst. So they sent me down to King's College, week later i had some of the worst tests i've had it was just painful because they had to they had to inject a dye into my groin into my main uh, main artery which went into the just specifically the left side of my brain mm. um so it just felt like someone was burning the side of my head um and the results from that was how the the artery looks i was awake the whole scan um but it was how the artery is looking in, or the, the main artery in my head is looking and then the doctor basically said there was more chance of me having a stroke from an operation um, and a 0.5-ish percent of it not bursting. Just do a scan every year. And then literally two weeks later, I'm like, I'm moving away. Why? I just want to explore the world. Well, so I, was, I was worried that it might burst. So I we, literally thought that might, might be what happened. So you were... <clears throat> so that, that whole incidents which basically you came out of it relatively unscathed which is mm. basically you have this thing from birth yeah um but you're not at risk but i guess in your head you're thinking i could die any moment. this could burst yeah and, and they did say and it were you could thinking burst. were you were you were you associating bursting with death yes because they they basically said you get about i think it was a while ago it's 2014 
I think it was you get 48 hours to get to a specific doctor, specific hospital. If it bursts. If it bursts. Like that is your time frame. If it happens, you need to go and see a, a surgeon, literally for surgery, within that 48 hours. And if you don't? And if you don't, don't it's, it's not, it won't be successful. So I, th I feel like if I put myself in your shoes, you could go one or two ways. Mm. One way could be, okay, I'm not going to leave the nest. I'm going to, you know, wrap myself in cotton wool. Mm -hmm. So this never happens again. And I just play it safe. Mm. Or you basically do the opposite, which I feel is like what you did, which is, Pretty much. all right, I've just got, if life is short, I'm just going to get out there and go and try enjoy and it. it. Yeah. So I went to speak to the surgeon before I moved to Kuwait and basically said, what happens if I move to Kuwait and this thing bursts? And he was like, well, our doctors from either NHS, private doctors, American doctors always fly to the Middle East because they need experienced doctors. So they come and do like a work trip for two weeks and do all these surgeries, all these things. So he said, there's always probably going to be a doctor around or you'll be able to get on a flight and you will do a fast, you'll get on the next flight out and come straight to the hospital. And so you knew so there was a, I if, had if to check there was happened, a bit of safety you've first. You've got a little yeah. safety net. What about just like your general mindset on life? Like, I feel like that is the end decision that comes from you have obviously decided that this is not a place you want to be. Mm -hmm. And why is that? You know, why, why, what made you think that, okay, like, why couldn't you have just said, well, I just need to live a larger life, uh, here in the UK. It, was it here. something that you were, was subconsciously on your mind for a long time that like you wanted to get out and this was like the sign that I just felt, yeah, I think maybe for a long time, I felt stuck in the same position mm -hmm. five years in one, in that same company. And I didn't explore much there. And then I was just cool. I'm living in this town. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get a bus, go to work, go home, sleep get up get a bus go to work like that was my life mm. um and crossfit was obviously crossfit then in the uk was quite small but in the middle east it seemed to be growing and i'd seen a lot of my friends were like middle east middle east go crossfit 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 and that's what dragged me here so well not here but middle east and middle okay east. you've spoken to the doctor you got a safety net in terms of, you know, that if you left, if shit did hit the fan, mm -hmm. you could still, you still had options to, to heal yourself. Yeah. Okay. So what else changed in your mindset? Like did that, did that, did the brain aneurysm and what, what followed, was there anything else that changed your life? One part of you is like, okay, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to explore the world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move to a different country and experience something new. Was there any other part of your life or you as a person that you thought you wanted to change or the knock on effect of that instance caused you to change? Um, I think it changed me a little bit, but I'm not, a hun I don't think it changed me like crazy. I think it just gave me a different perspective on life. It was more like live it in this exact moment. And you'll notice I'm not the best at planning and I just take any of like good opportunities as they come rather than searching far in advance for these things. Um, it just made me go, right, let's just, let's just do it. Let's just go here. Let's just go there. And whereas I used to have to be like, Oh, can we afford to go here? Can we afford to, whereas now I'm just like, let's go. That's, that's my, because there might not be a tomorrow. Exactly. You never know. But I mean, everyone talks about that, right? The mm -hmm. idea of like, you got to be where your feet are or, you know, be a hundred percent present in what you're doing. Uh, but I think a lot of us very like struggle to actually live a life like that. Mm. We're so stuck in the future and what we want our lives to look like or how much money we want to earn. And mm. I find it very admirable that people, people who do that. I actually had a friend of mine who was a rugby teammate who decided for one year, he would make every big decision in his life based on the roll of a dice that's brave yeah that so it would be terrible. like if, if someone posed a question like mm. you should fly to south america this summer he'd roll the dice yeah and if it was yes he he'd would just go. roll. He if would it just was go. no he'd stay yeah and yeah. it was like but you that some of the some of the, the adventures that he had that mm -hmm. year um that came as a result of this were just wild and probably some of the best in his life as well yeah you know and the takeaway that he he had from that whole year was that like okay what what if i just got rid of the dice 
you know, will I, I still take these opportunities? Yeah, do, why, why aren't I taking these opportunities? Mm. Um, it's tough though, because like sometimes you do need to rationalize things yeah. and you've still got to think about like, well, finances and, yeah, but exactly. I think the general, the general for me is of being a bit more present in your life is pretty damn cool. Yeah. Would you say that's something that you still embody today? A little bit less now. Now I have Mason. Um, so who's Mason? The little boy, the little man, our little child, um, Mason James. Um, he's changed us a lot. So we're now like, we really want to do these things, but we also want to make sure he has the best life he can. And so that's where our life's gone to now is more, let's make sure he's having a good time. He's got money in the future to be able to travel and do what we've done in the past. So Okay, so I skipped a bit of the story there. So Q8, move to Q8. Where does that journey take you? So from Kuwait is where I met Megan. Um, Megan did come to Kuwait, but it wasn't for us together as a, as a, as a couple. I found out about your first date, by the way. Oh yeah. I, asked I can't wait to tell you that. Continue. <laughs> and then her life and family were all in Dubai. And she was like, right, I know someone that can get you a job in Dubai. Shall we move to Dubai? And obviously me being me, I was like, that sounds great. Let's go. Um, and Dubai sort of is the way to go if you've moved to the Middle East. It's like the next, it is the next step, but it's not always the next step. But in that moment in time, it was the next step for us as a couple. And to get into that Dubai CrossFit life was a good time to do it. Um, and in Dubai, I was there for, I went to that company, I think it was two years, maybe just over. And then Elliot Simmons posted on his account, there's a job going at Yas. There's actually, I think there was two jobs going at Yas. Me being me, Elliot, 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 like, I want this job, give me this job. Like, I want to join Yas. Um, and honestly, he managed to set up an interview. And we sat at that interview and they was like, you've already got the job. You've got recommendations from Elliot. Um, this is now your starting coaching in Yas, which is in Abu Dhabi. Uh, CrossFit Yas and we were there maybe three years that was one of my favorite times of the Middle East um, it was a good environment the Abu Dhabi is a little bit slower than Dubai um, so you're not spending 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 all the time um, and you can travel well still from Abu Dhabi and then after Abu Dhabi so we had given in our notice for Abu Dhabi and we're like we were planning to get married in South Africa. So we we're like, right, let's leave Abu Dhabi. It was a year contract in Abu Dhabi. You pay for your rent up front for that whole year. And if you sign a new contract, you pretty much got a whole nother year on your lease. Um, so we decided to move and our route probably now I think of it probably wasn't the best idea was cool. Let's go to South Africa. For, which is where Megan's from. Which is where Megan's originally from, where her parents now are. Um, let's go there. Let's go stay there for a little while. I think it was a few months at the time. Get married. Um, then fly to the UK and move to the UK. Don't ask why we went the opposite way to go back to the UK. Funds wise, it was not going to happen because moving Megan to the UK is one so of the hardest things Is this an example of do. where just making rash decisions without thinking about didn't it. Didn't go pay to plan. Off. Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. So <laughs> but South so Africa so was there, really cool. So there is sometimes a, a bad it, yeah. side to that, that yeah. way of thinking. Uh, not a bad side, but a, a less It was still effective. great, yeah. but not the best route. Yeah. Um, and then we stayed in South Africa for a year, just over a year while we had Mason. Mason was born there. Um, and then at four months old, I was recruited for a job in Saudi Arabia. Um, was that, was that something by choice? Had you, had you, have you always felt like a gravitational pull towards the Middle East evidence movement? No. Or? So weird, weird kind of spoke about, so in South Africa in the fitness world is depending where you are, it's super hard to earn a good wage. We were surviving off of our wage with me, Megan and Mason. When Mason got there, obviously it was a little bit tough, tougher. Um, but in the Middle East, we'd been like, oh, maybe we should move back. Like we'll have a job at CrossFit Yas. Like we know if we emailed them, like any jobs going, if there was something going, I think they would take pretty much take job. us back. Um, and then Tyler Clark, 
messaged me as a joke. Mark, there's this really cool opportunity come up in Saudi. And I literally replied, fuck no. Literally, that is my exact words. I'm not coming to Saudi. And he was like, oh, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. And then he, being Tyler, if you know Tyler, was like, this is how much you're going to get paid. This is what's included. This is what comes with what you're doing. You'll earn a lot of money and you'll save money. And I was sat back, sat with Megan. And I think it was two hours later, Megan was like, I think you need to do it. So I literally sent my CV again, one day, literally not much thinking, let's go to Saudi Arabia, let's go and do it. Um, had the interviews, I moved out. It was quite a quick process. I'd say I had my interview, maybe 12 days. I was on an airplane to Saudi Arabia. Oh. Hardest thing I've done, because obviously leaving Mason at that age, I've just had a child and I've had to leave him at four months old, five months maybe. Um, it was one of the hardest things I've done. Um, I'm, I still remember the day before we had quite a big cry while we were putting him to sleep. And I was like, I don't know if I can actually go. Um, I don't know if I can be away from Megan that long. Um, but then I knew that she was planning to join me in Saudi Arabia. And then once she joined, we worked there. I was there for just over a year. Um, we saw that Coastal had posted and Megan said from, oh, I don't know how long she's been on the programming. She has said one day I'd love to go and work at Coastal. Just one we've known, we've seen you on social. We'd seen, I've known Ant and Tammy for quite a long time. I've known Alex for probably longer than I've known those two. Um, let's, let's apply. And at the time you'd only posted one, one opportunity. And we were both like, oh, if we both apply, one of us might get it, but let's just go anyway. It's one of those rash decisions. If one of us gets it, we'll fix the other and, part. And this is because life in Saudi Arabia it wasn't what you'd envisioned, right? It wasn't what we weren't enjoying it at this time. Right. Yeah. So it you was, were, you needed, you were looking for a change and it was just happened to it be. It just at happened that time. to be at that specific time. It was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we both got the job and here we are. And it was again, it wasn't, it wasn't quick, but it felt like it was like a week. Yeah. And move, a week, a move was... to Hong Kong is never, <laughs> never a fast no. thing with visas and all yeah. that stuff. But I remember, I remember putting that post up, um, and we had, we've never had that many applicants for a mm. job, um, for a coaching role here. And like, we were just inundated with people from all over the world, mm. um, who were looking for a coaching job here. And I remember Meg responded. She actually starts, she first replied to the story saying, oh, one day I would love to, I would love to work there. And I just said, why didn't you apply? Yeah. I just, I think I just said, just apply. And I think that was her little seed planted and yeah. she's like, actually, maybe we should do it. I, just, I think I just said, just apply. Like, why yeah. are you messaging me that? And why knowing Megan apply? or me, it's probably our way of being like, just checking, testing, yeah, the just waters. testing you a little bit, just like, just contacting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. In which case, very that smart. That was us getting in. <laughs> yeah. And then no. I remember, yeah, you two submitting your, you know, because obviously I didn't really know you, but you know, you joined in yeah. on our webinars. You've mm. been on the, on the, on the program. I think for some the only time. chat we'd actually had was that webinar. Yeah. Like, like five minutes yeah. before the webinar started. And that was before other people joined. So, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, obviously heard lots of great things from all the people that you talked about already. Mm -hmm. So loads of people were vouching for you already. And we both just felt, I mean, as a team, I mean, my, myself and Liam were handling the applications. Mm -hmm. Just as soon as you guys submitted your applications, we were like, it's going to be them. Perfect. And it was step <laughs> one of a pretty long Yeah, there was, there was a pretty process. long process. I'd love the process. I thought it was great. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We, you know, that's, it's always been something that's really hard, you know, with international coaches, like how do you really get to the bottom of who someone is and know if that's the right person for your organization? Yeah. When you've already worked with people in some capacity, like you and Meg, mm. you've obviously got, there's a head start on it already, but we, we, that was the very first time we've ever had a video submission for a job application. That video submission <laughs> is the most stressful thing I've done other than having a baby. So, <laughs> so <laughs> listeners, what, what we're talking about here is that we required everyone who replied for a job, mm. they had to start with the video submission talking about why they wanted to join the coastal team. And the reason we did that was because knowing things like AI these days and how easy it is to write a really good looking cover letter. And we've just seen so many great cover letters and great compelling stories over the years. You never know 
anymore if it's genuinely coming from a person or it's something that's been scripted. So, you know, we said, you know, if we did a video submission, there's no way you can hide. So let's go with the video submission. I mean, you probably, you actually can now. Apparently now you can do AI, AI yeah. videos that do like lip syncing. I'll do that next time. <laughs> yeah, lip syncing <laughs> boy, which will basically mean that that's going to be obsolete at some point. So uh, we're really happy with like with the whole hiring process and I'm glad you found, you thought it was good as well. It was great. Uh, it did take me, I counted a minimum 60 takes for that video. That was, your, be that was your best one. Huh? That was your best one, the one yeah. you submitted. Yeah, Mate, I'd, and love there was... I'd love to see the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> and there was lots that I got to about one minute, and I just messed up everything that come out of my mouth. And I was like, "Nope, next, do it again." So, so it took I, about I think, an hour and a half. I think to do one I know. I know video. Meg said she didn't actually do that many, but she did start with like take fifty five. Yeah, she did a couple. She did a couple, but not fifty five. <laughs> <laughs> She's I speaking of half did fifty five plus. <laughs> um, let's talk about like your mark the athlete. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been in CrossFit for a long time. Yes. So obviously 2014. Uh, yeah, so I think when I you started in 2013. I'm guessing, mm. I'm guessing if you've got a brain aneurysm doing, well, you figured out, yeah, brain aneurysm, yeah. doing death by back squats, you're already doing CrossFit then because yeah. no one's stupid enough to do death by back squats unless they're doing CrossFit. CrossFit football, that's what I was following. Oh, you're doing CrossFit Yeah, that's football? what it was at the time. Uh, with, uh, what's his name? I can't remember now. Big John. Time. Yeah, that's it. What's yeah. his name? I can't remember his last name. I used to love their stuff. <laughs> I used to love, like, because they were just the, uh, they were the only uh, CrossFitters who were actually really strong. Yeah. And that's why I followed it. I was like, yeah, let's get let's get really strong and just do what we're doing. I should have I should have followed it. Yeah. I still listen to their <laughs> podcast. They're bloody good. Um, okay, I feel like you've always been. I feel like you, you are a pretty strong guy. Um, yeah. What are your numbers right now? Snatch, clean jack. Uh, One hundred and twenty-six kilo snatch, which you've been able to do since like two thousand and fourteen. Have you not? Yeah, I think the first time I hit it was two thousand and fifteen. I saw the video. The other so that's day. really good. You've gained. You've added one kilogram to your snatch in nine years. Yeah, but I had, when I went, we'll go into this subject later. Is when we, I was vegan, it did drop quite a bit. Okay, get we're gonna get to that. <laughs> that that ruins my story a little Sorry. bit. <laughs> um, okay, so you got one twenty six snatch, clean jerk. Uh, currently one forty, but I'm pretty sure I could do a one forty five, one fifty. Pretty sure you can as yeah. well. Based I just on what you I think the way I when I tested it, I was pretty fatigued, and I probably wasn't meant to test. I went a bit off the programming. Okay, when you, when you first snatched, mm. when you I guess I'm guessing that's when you first stepped into CrossFit gym. Was it the first? It might have been the second time I no. Uh, so I dipped into CrossFit and then I went back to doing CrossFit in a Globo gym and I went back to a CrossFit gym. And so that's when I'd done. This is 2013-14. Yeah, 2013. So you are how old? 32. So okay, so we're talking you're 22, 23 years old. Yeah. How much could you snatch then? Uh, my first time snatching, literally first time, I hit, I think it was 85 or 90 kilos. That is mental. I think it was. It might be if between 80 and 90 and I could snatch and I could just get into an overhead squat. I could, yeah. So it wasn't even a bad looking snatch. It was no, probably... my clean was probably less than my snatch at the time. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know why I could snatch, but I could snatch. You know, my first regional was in 2014. I opened with a 55 kg snatch and I missed it. <laughs> I hit, I hit. At regionals as well. At regionals. <laughs> and that was, they took a photo of, and my second lift was 135 pounds, which yeah. I hit by the way. And that was a photo that they use on CrossFit.com main oh, site. I've made it. To basically say like, age of regional week yeah like <laughs> scores, guys are a bit scores <laughs> incomparable to every other region. There was me like grunting through a 60 kg snatch. So, okay, so I'm guess I can only, well, all I can take from that is you're naturally a pretty strong dude. Mm. However, you have been also training for a really long time. Yeah. You actually did gymnastics as a kid. Am I, am yes. I right? Yeah. Well, when you say gymnastics as a kid, like, is that you, your mum and dad put you into like a multi sports thing and you were doing a bit of everything, or were you actually doing like gymnastics? I was competing in gymnastics. So you're doing competitions, you're getting scored. Yeah. What? Okay, two questions. Firstly, why did your parents put you to gymnastics or was that your choice? No, so I went to, if I remember rightly, my mum said I went to a birthday party and it was in Europa, which was the gymnasium at the time. And it was just, it wasn't in the actual gym. It was like a little cafe next door and it was like a soft play. And apparently one of the coaches come up was like, that kid needs to do gymnastics. Don't know what I was doing. I was just probably doing four drinking or something. a milkshake. Yeah. yeah, probably. I was probably <laughs> just sat there and like, that kid needs to do it. Smart. Um, and then obviously mum being like a parent was like oh i'm gonna put him into gymnastics that'll be that'll be great for him um and it just 
duck and I did that for a long time. Did you love it? Yeah, until I got to the day that I didn't want to go. And that was when I actually broke my wrist. And that was me done. I just stopped. Like, I literally loved it, loved it, loved it. And then I got to an age, I was like, oh, I don't even want to do it. I don't know what age it was. Can I ask you why? What 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 was stopping you wanting to do it? I think... Was it just not cool anymore? It was very competitive. Right. Like, it was the squad of the, of the gym at the time. So training was not super strict, but it was strict. But it was train, 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 compete. Train, 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 train like... And how, like, how often are you training as a kid? Oh, I don't remember now. I, I would say it was every, most nights. I'd, or maybe four or five. Yeah. Maybe four nights, five nights. Or depending what it's week it was, long. it might have been three. Yeah. And was that your only sport? Your main uh, sport as a kid? That was my main sport. And then rugby, I think I started at six or seven. And by the age of when I quit gymnastics, I think one of the things in my head was, actually, I'm pretty good at rugby let's stay with playing rugby um because they don't really they don't bounce off each other gymnastics and rugby you got to be light and springy and fast on a gymnastics floor but you need to be really strong and fast on a rugby pitch and i, I didn't find that they looking back at it now they kind of do probably do yeah but back then it didn't because it was like be really flexible be really stretchy whereas rugby you just needed to be strong are you grateful for those years as a gymnast oh uh, yeah now? definitely i wish i did it for longer yeah now i do crossfit i remember doing my first ring muscle up and i was like oh i should have done crossfit for uh, gymnastics for a lot longer i'm for sure as well because like for someone as big as you are like you are you're super mobile yeah like i think the mobility supple, stayed yeah, yeah that must have just carried over yeah i think because i literally got stretched every single day <laughs> Like every day was stretching, stretching, stretching. So is it you basically got to a point where you stopped gymnastics, not because it wasn't cool. Because because when Maybe I it when wasn't I, cool at school. I think I was the well, only person who did it. That's why I stopped playing clarinet. Because I, clarinet. I was I was embarrassed to <laughs> carry my one foot. I was just genuinely embarrassed to carry my clarinet case okay. in school. Yeah, so maybe it was that. I just don't didn't think of that. Because back then, I mean now if if I was at school doing gymnastics, I'd be like Mate, I can do a I can do a back handspring and you can't. I, yeah. I would actually think it would be a very a very cool. cool thing to do. Mm. But when I was, you know, when our age difference isn't that big, mm. I when I think back to school school years, the only people doing gymnastics were girls. It, yeah, it certainly was, where majority I was, certainly was a girls' yeah. sport back then. So yeah. it was. I think if you were a guy doing gymnastics, just like if you were a guy doing dance, mm. now I look at those things and I think, wow, what amazing expressions of movement mm. that I wish I got into at a young age. Yeah. But back then because of just the norms of society i think and mm. what like boys should be doing it wasn't it wasn't cool yeah it definitely wasn't and we obviously had to put leotards on and other kids didn't because they didn't do gymnastics and yeah it was it was it was it, it something we, just out of interest was it something that like you were proud of like to be i was super gymnastics? proud of that age because yeah. so, i was doing pretty well for what i was doing like i i was pretty comfortable on every piece and what um, what, what was your specialty floor and vault so floors like back handsprings and flips and somersaults yes. and stuff. Yeah. Not with the stick in the... Uh, Not with the twirly it. ribbon, yeah. <laughs> Imagine me doing that now. <laughs> I can picture you do that. You move, you move like a swan so I can picture yeah, there you it. there you go. And so vault as well. And the vault as well. So yeah. vault's a sprint, like jump on the board. Jump, some sort of flip and then land. That's sick. Yeah. Which was probably, I would say that was maybe my best out of all of them. Um, so whenever there was a floor and vault competition, I would always enter and i'd always do pretty well in it that's so awesome mm. do you back yourself on a vault now if i i reckon you, i could if you put one in front of me and there was a foam pit the other side i reckon i could do something on it what do you reckon if there was a foam pit on the other side the best trick you could do in a vault right now maybe just literally a handspring just handspring yeah i don't think i've got the confidence to <laughs> <laughs> man i reckon i could do a handspring i probably i know i dislocate both shoulders in the process but yeah. i could give it a nudge <laughs> <laughs> i reckon if a week or two practice of getting the confidence i reckon i could that's awesome do something cooler but not that cool i'm a bit heavier than what i was back then yeah <laughs> transitioning to crossfit did you have aspirations to be an athlete uh like competitive i no. mean like middle east at my... that time was like everyone was wanting to be a coach middle east when i moved to middle east i was like yeah let's do this but then that was sort of when the regions changed so as soon as i moved to asia they stopped allowing your passport yeah it would people could like we couldn't go to asia regionals because we wasn't from Kuwait. yeah um so everyone ended up being europe regionals and 
I just knew Europe was so strong then that I probably wouldn't compete. I would do local competitions and that was it. So so just local competitions. Yeah. Do you never had aspirations to try and get to no, I would, regionals? I would be games? interested in team. I think team would be fun. But individual, no. I don't think my competitive side's there. What what about CrossFit has kept you coming back for so long? I just love it. I just love CrossFit. I just love fitness. I love that everyone loves fitness. Everyone loves getting strong. Everyone, 99% of the time, supports each other. Um, and you get great results from it. Injuries? I've had quite a few injuries. Um, Obviously broke your wrist as a gymnast. Gymnast, wrist, that was just because we were messing around. It wasn't even doing... It <laughs> wasn't doing anything specific. We were literally swinging on a rope. Um, and that's how that broke. Um, I've torn... I tore my adductor doing a split jerk. It's pretty impressive. Which was a fun one. That was in Kuwait. Is this... Did, did I... Have I? Am I getting this correct where you did a split jerk and you basically moved into the splits? Yeah, so I, my back foot fully slipped out. And yeah, I just heard a pop and, and then everything spasmed and I couldn't get off the platform. There's still photos of me on the floor, probably on Facebook. Um, I think then... Was it in a lifting meet? No, it was just training. Just training. Like we'd done back squats in session one and then not long before session two and we didn't really warm up. We're like, I, was, I think I was 22. I was like, oh, I don't need to warm up. I still not the best warm up. I don't do the best warm ups now. But back then it was like, cool, let's load a bar up. I can lift this weight. Like, cool, 60 kilos, 80 kilos, 100 kilos, 110, pop. Like that was literally my warm up for two row max split jerk or something. Like, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so I think that was just a silly thing. And my next major injury was I tore my lat. I don't know if it was a tear. I don't know if it was a dislocate of my shoulder in a competition. But the two common things within both injuries was I was using a Mark Pro at the time. For li I've literally used a Mark Pro twice in my life. Yeah, I think I overused a Mark Pro the night before, both of the, comp the training and the competition. And both times I've torn a muscle or something. Interesting. Yeah, literally the day after. It's interesting. Mark Pro made such a... They were making so much noise mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. Mark Pro, Red Dot um what complex complex yeah. everyone i remember i would use my complex every single night as well yeah and then i don't know i just don't really see anyone using them anymore not at all i've seen complex a little bit more yeah but i think with complex it's a set time so you can't be like can't oh let's it. use it for an hour i'm pretty sure at 22 i was like oh this feels really nice let's use it for an hour and i think that was my mistake yeah it was i wasn't i didn't have enough knowledge on the intention and in how to it, use yeah. it properly yeah i did the same though i used to sit programming I and I great. used to put the Mark Pro on yeah. every muscle in my body and Literally, sit there for like just two hours shake. just like twitching. <laughs> Probably not the best thing. No, yeah, and that's honestly where two of my main injuries come from was that. And how about now? Like, would you say that you're, are you pretty injury free? I'm um, feeling pretty good. My, I've had a bit of a right foot injury since about November. Um, it's recovered. It doesn't cause pain. It's just not got the mobility back in it yet. Mm. Um, so I have to warm it up. It just feels like something's locking it a little bit. Um, I should probably go see a physio or get an x-ray. Um, but that is about it that's causing anything. And what are like, do you, are you someone who sets goals in your training? Like, do you want to do things like, I mean, we're doing the open right now, but is that something that's important to you or? No, I just love training. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I like the process of enjoying the process. Like, cool. You're doing this for the next 12 weeks and just follow it. And I love that. I love coming into the gym. Um, training with people and just enjoying lifting without the stress of you need to compete. You need to go and do really well in this An open workout. I used to hate them because I felt like people judged you mm. for your, your performance. And it's made me go, ah, oh, it doesn't actually matter anymore. Like just come out, give it your best and have fun while doing it. And that's what's changed maybe in the last four, yeah, four years. I was like, that doesn't matter. Like just have nice. fun. Yeah. Do you still feel the pressure at all? Do you no. feel like the old voice is creeping in or now nah, you're totally at ease Not at it? all. Yeah. If, uh, if someone's screaming at me, then maybe. Like, I'm one of those people I like to be a little bit quieter. Yeah. So. Yeah. Me too, mate. Yeah. I hate it when someone gets in my face. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier being vegan. Yes. So I think you'd mentioned that this was something to do with you not progressing your snatch. Yeah. So I was giving you shit about not progressing your snatch. <laughs> 
um, over the last nine years, but you said that there was a vegan there was part a in that. So yes. tell me about that. So we went vegan. I don't know what year or till what year. So it, this was a, this oh, was no, a when, till what you year. and Meg made this decision together. Yeah. So pretty much the whole family went vegan, like Megan, Megan's sister, Megan's partner, um, obviously Megan and I didn't, I, I was like, I don't want to go vegan. Like, I love meat and eggs. Like, literally, my breakfast every day was bacon and eggs at the time. Um, they all went vegan. And I was just going to work. I was still two minds. I didn't know what was better at the time. I, a vegan diet's great. Uh, any diet is great, as long as you're doing it the right way. Um, but every night, I was getting home, and Megan's sister had cooked some sort of meal obviously vegan and i was getting home nine o'clock at night and i was like oh, i just want dinner i'm not gonna make my own dinner i'll just eat what they've left out so that was my first meal that i sort of reduced being any meat in and then as it went on over time i was just doing that every day and i was like oh now i'm getting rid i'm feeling okay like my energy levels are pretty good um so i slowly took each meal i removed the animal product um, until I think eggs was probably the and there last wasn't, one. There wasn't like ethical reasons for this. It was for just, me, no. It was just convenience and because the meals that were getting cooked for you were basically all vegan anyway. Yeah, and I wasn't wasn't having to cook. Right, which is great when you come home from work and you got dinner on the table yeah. made by someone that's a great cook. You're like, oh, I'll just eat that. That's that's amazing. I'll just enjoy. Um, so I had no, I did not want to go vegan for any other reason. Um, and then, like I said, I started feeling great, but then it regressed quite quick because vegan, obviously, it's healthy most of the time, but you can be like a very, clean, yeah. yeah, but you can be a very unhealthy vegan. Right. The sure. things that are vegan are not always the best thing. Like Oreos are vegan, for example. Right. So you're like, cool, what snack can I have? Oh, let's have a whole pack of Oreos. And you just start eating them. So you can be a very unhealthy vegan and you have a lot of oils within your diet yeah you live off avocado but and i don't think too much avocado is the best for you on obviously avocado is great but it's not the best for you every day right um and then i noticed i didn't notice that my strength numbers were either they'd gone they'd gone down um because megan and i took a little bit of time off crossfit for a little while and then we joined back at inner fight um and got back in into our crossfit life and we're like cool we want to get back training that's sort of what kicked us back into it um so my numbers sort of stayed the same they were quite a lot lower they're probably about 80 percent, no 70 75 percent of what they are now and what they were before that and then only when i went so i added creatine back into my diet when i was in south africa and then i can't remember why we went vegetarian when Mason was born, the best thing for obviously a child is to have some sort of act, like whole protein. And the nurse had told Megan she's going to have to have some sort of egg or some. And so we were like, cool, let's go vegetarian. Um, oh, I didn't realize it was that recent that you guys moved back. Yeah, no, it was. I would say we went vegetarian in when Mason, literally when Mason was born. It was. I'm pretty sure it was the day after that we were like, no, we're going to have to do this for his sake. Obviously, I wasn't doing it for any other reason. I was like, great, let's go and have this. Let's go and eat some eggs for breakfast. Like, I was, Good I'm way. not that fussed. Right. Um, and then that was when I started noticing my strength numbers. Honestly, I had, I had a creatine in my nutrition. I had eggs in my nutrition. And my numbers slowly creeped up week after week. Mm. Don't know if there's anything to do with the food. I don't know if I was just moving better or feeling better. But that was the one thing I know I changed for sure. And I feel like that was what happened to my body personally. So was that enough evidence? Was it was it that progress again that gave the evidence to say, actually, I'm going to go, I'm moving back to... No, I still stayed vegetarian for a long time. Mm. Um, it must have been... Oh, it was five, at least five months vegetarian. And then Saudi come along. And I spoke to Ty. I was like go and have a look if there's any vegan options in any of your local supermarkets. I don't know if he looked, I don't know if he, cause he always gave us shit for being vegan. Yeah. He was like, no, just eat this steak. He always kept just saying, eat this, eat that. 
so I don't know if he looked, I don't know if he did look or not, um, but I believed him. And he was like, there's no vegan stuff. So I sat with Megs, I was like, Megs, I think I'm going to have to add meat back in my diet. Otherwise, I'm going to be living off of literally actual plants rather than like a meal, meat replacement, which is what we were doing to keep our protein levels high enough to train like we do. Um, so I moved to Saudi and my fridge, they'd stocked it up a little bit because they do like a stock up for new people. Um was just meat and eggs. Literally, there was nothing else in there. It was meat, eggs, and then some rice in the cupboard. Um, and the manager at the time, he was like, I did not know you were vegan yesterday. Like, literally. He was like, you were vegan yesterday, but Tyler never told me that you were vegan. Um, so he had, like, a panic. I was like, no, 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 I've decided I'm going to be, I'm going to try and introduce some meat back into my diet now. Like, because I know I'm not going to find much here yet. I'm sure there will be in the future. And then I, my body didn't react any different. What, Some what people was, go, what was that first steak like? It was pretty good. Yeah. It was, was it something it that you tasted were like, nice. were you craving it again or was it? So I, Megan's dad does a great, they call it a braai in South yeah. Africa, um, barbecue for the English li li uh, listeners is he does a great braai and his pork, uh, no lamb chops smell incredible. And he's done in the past, he's put lamb chops in our bag when we've had vegan food he's like i'll oh, just eat one of those like and it's always been one of those things and that was the one thing i did miss and every time he cooked them i was like megan i, I think i want one and she's like are you sure and i'm like yeah like i would like i would probably enjoy it and she's like yeah because no vegan like misses that taste they love the taste they just do it because it's an animal right um, so that was sort of in my brain. I was never against it. It was just more putting it off for longer. Right. Um, and then Saudi, obviously I was straight back in. And, and so, but, so what's it looking like now for you? What is your, so being a vegan taught me a lot. It made me go, right. I actually need obviously my protein, my, my veggies, which I was probably avoiding a lot back then. And like carbohydrates, and it was giving me healthier options. Mm -hmm. So rather than just meat and eggs and steak and that it was making me it's actually making me eat a little bit better like i now look at food i'm like oh i need to add more veggies into that and that's what's improved quite a bit love it yeah mark what are you doing here what are you focusing on now now that you're in hong kong you're part of the coastal team yeah part of the process team mm -hmm. what are the things that you're focusing on uh so one of my job roles is personal training um so i can work with small groups and one-to-one -one personal training um looking obviously improving people's lifestyle helping them get fitter stronger um and supporting them through that journey uh and then occasionally we'll be doing some group classes as well uh what about photography mate ah and photography i forgot that's one of my roles here <laughs> so i've been taking photograph uh, photos of fitness for a long time um so that is going to be one of my roles here at coastal is snapping some shots of classes and people working out um, so people have got some content to. Use. I heard that Meg taught you everything. No, you know. she didn't. Is that she true? taught me some bits. <laughs> so, but actually, both of you have quite like a a, fit, a photography, videography, creative side to you. Yeah, she's got a very good eye. Yeah, so she knows exactly what a photo should look like. Probably gave if I gave her a camera, she'd half know how to use it, but because she doesn't look at it every day. She's kind of like, oh, I don't know what button, what button I need to move to change this. But if she can just literally aim something at a, uh, for, like what she wants to take a photo of, it'll be an incredible photo. Yeah, it's bloody good. I just want to say, Mark, it's really good having you two on the team. Um, we love that you're bringing this like extra dimension of like the creative <laughs> side, the two of you as well. Yeah. Um, and in the short time that you've been here, like I'm very, very excited about what you guys are going to bring to the team and what we're going to create together. I'm really looking forward to it, honestly. Mark, we have a question that we ask all new guests on this podcast. Okay. And that question is, describe your perfect day. Oh, I know what Megan said, but I don't think that's the same as mine. I think Meg's day was, there's quite, there quite a lot of strawberry daiquiris in yeah. there and not a whole lot else. No, a lot of sun and a lot there's of water. a lot of sun yeah. and water, yeah. And I could tell you that would be the Western in Dubai as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my perfect day has changed in the last two years. Um, obviously, family time is very key to me now. Um, so that's one thing that makes me super happy. Um, being with Megan and Mason. Um, so ideally, I wake up, smash a lot of coffee, 
Love a coffee. How many coffees are we talking? <laughs> Let's say two just to be safe, actually. I actually, could probably do three or sounds four. Sounds like you want three or but four. But it might mate. make me shake a little bit. Are you making your coffee? Are you buying your coffee out? Um, currently on some instant coffee. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. It's disappointing. But <laughs> but sometimes I love to go to a coffee shop. Yeah. So on that perfect day, I'd go to a coffee shop with Megs and Mason. Um, probably grab some breakfast out. I don't mind cooking that either. We make pretty good breakfast, just eggs and toast. But Apparently you, lo- you guys love baked beans. Love baked beans. So it's a genuine question because I your breakfast now, mm-hmm. which is basically toast, eggs, eggs and beans. And beans. That mm-hmm. was literally my uni breakfast it's for so about good. four years. But I actually had to stop because I genuinely farted so much <laughs> when I would have I'm not beans. that gassy at the minute. No, really? No. I just, I Maybe don't you just become anything. immune. Maybe I'm just not having as many beans as you were. I was having quite a lot of beans. <laughs> but like We de- share one of those small cans. So it's what, what, what's your go-to brand? Uh, Heinz. Okay, yeah. yeah. Classic. But I, if I have a, if I have like five baked beans now, sometimes in the hotel buffet, I'll have just a few baked beans. Within You're off. Hour, you can't I'm stop. Off. I can't stop for at least four or five hours. Okay, so maybe eating breakfast at home, maybe eating out. Then yeah, what? either one. I love breakfast. I think breakfast is my favorite meal. Me so too. That'd make me happy. Um, train. Definitely train. Probably some Olympic lifting. Not any cardio-based stuff. <laughs> and then afternoon it would be more go to the park with mason let him have a good time if it was not here in hong kong obviously eventually we'll be going to a beach a beach with mason would be ideal with somewhere he can run around play get outside and then finish with i'm actually pretty much the opposite to megan i don't drink as much as what she would like to do on a perfect day i'd love a beer um one or two what's and your then, go-to oh here, uh, there's a beer called, yeah, I think it's Y-A-U. I'm not going to butcher the name. Yeah. That's a good, I quite enjoy that beer. Yeah. Um, that is a, that's like a craft beer, right? Yeah, it's a little can, yeah. pink can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd probably have two of those. Or a castle from South Africa. Nice. I love a castle. Yeah. It's pretty good. Um, and then, probably game. What, what are you gaming? Oh, a bit of Call of Duty, a bit of Apex. Sometimes I've been dragged into Fortnite recently because of Skulky. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's probably it. And then chill with Megs. Love it. Yeah. She games too. So probably with her. Who's a better gamer? Definitely me. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's she's not as bad. She's she makes out that she's bad, but she's not. I can picture I can picture you right. <laughs> Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure, my no, friend. Thanks for having um, me. thank you very much for joining for your very first ever podcast. Yep, never done one of these before. I feel like I know a lot about you already now, a lot yep. more about you. Um, and as I said, very, very much looking forward to you being a part of this team and achieving some amazing things together. Really looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Cheers, mate.